Worship Center where the apostle of this house is Pastor Mike Davis. We greet you in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And thank you for joining us this evening, Facebook family. It's a rainy day outside, but God is still good. Some of us got distracted by the weather, but he's still good. So we want to get into our Bible study tonight, and I'm kind of piggybacking off what Apostle was on Sunday, Restoration. And the Lord said, stay in the vein. So I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about restoration. And I don't understand what restoration is. You got to understand why there has to be a restoration. You see, God had already given us a perfect plan for the church in the beginning. He already he expected man to follow this pattern, but man wasn't satisfied. So we said, so man made his own changes. We have changed stuff. We have docked up. We have made scriptures to benefit our needs and our wants, but it's not following the plan of God. And God needs for man to return back to the pattern that was given him by God. So what is the purpose then of, of restoration? The purpose is to bring God's people back to God's way in Christ. For the body of Christ has departed from the original plans and things that God had put in place. It needs to recognize such and make every effort to go back to the original plan that was given by God. Which is sound doctrine and be of the same mind speaking the same things. We have so many people confused because one church is saying this, another church is saying that, another person is saying this, one person is saying that, but it's not lining up with the word. And we have this season and this recession of time, we must line up with the word of God. And in researching the Bible, there's only one time in biblical history that restoration was not mentioned. And this time was between Genesis 1, 31 and Genesis 3 and 6, and that's when sin was non-existent. Genesis 1 and 31 says it's like this. God gave all that he, he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning at the sixth day. And when we jump down to Genesis 3 and 6, it says, When the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. All creation was affected by the sin of Eve and Adam. Of course, that, that does not mean that all creation is guilty of sin, but even though not guilty of Adam's sin, but we were all affected by it. Romans 12 and 5 says it like this. Therefore, as such, as though through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all sins. 1 Corinthians 15 and 21 says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of death. We have to understand that God is the God of restoration. When we talk about restoration, many times when, people, when you hear the apostle or the pastor or the teacher talk about restoration, the first thing we start looking at is financial blessings. God is not talking about financial blessings. He wants to restore his word to the people. He wants to restore the doctrine of salvation by grace. He wants to restore the rebaptism in the Holy Spirit. He wants to restore holiness, restore the fear of God, the reverence of God, restore the body ministry of the gifts of the Spirit, and restore praise and worship. We must understand that everything belongs to God. Hey, Haggai 2 and 8 says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Proverbs 13 and 22 says it's like this. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Ephesians 1 and 3 says it's like this. Blessed be the God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We must understand that everything, everything belongs to God. God is the restorer of people's lives. He can restore things in our, our lives that we thought once were lost. But as again, you heard me say a few minutes ago, sometimes we want to look for the material blessings to be restored. And that's all good in its, in, in its 
perspective and in its place. But God wants to do more than that. A few examples, he brought restoration in the life of Joseph. You see, God had given Joseph a dream back in Genesis. And he boasted of the dream to his brothers. And of course, they didn't like the dream. And he was thrown in the pit. And he was sold. But he was cast into the dungeon of prison. But he also got raised in a palace. He talked about restoring life. Right? Moses. Moses, you know, his mother put him in a bush in the Nile. But he was groomed to be a leader in the line to be the Pharaoh. God gave him a vision of being the deliverer of his people. He became a shepherd. He was restored to position of leadership. God the Father restored life of Jesus. He was born to be king of kings. He was born into poverty. He was pressed. He was lied on. He was ridiculed. He was sentenced to be crucified. He died and was buried. But he was raised to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What is it that you need God to restore in your life? A dream that you thought was lost, like Joseph? That he had given the vision and with him being in the palace and now being in the dungeon and, and, and sold into slavery? I perhaps I think he probably thought everything was lost. But God had another plan for him. God, he said, Jeremiah says, 29, 11 says it like this. He says, I know the plans and the thoughts that I have towards you. And they are good. And they are not evil. And they do have a, a, a perspective in. In other words, there is something at the end. We, we as humans, we don't like to go through anything. When we go through something, most of the time we go through murmuring and complaining. But sometimes you're going to have to get the attitude just like Jesus. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. For God is a God of wisdom. And he knows what's best for us. Even when Eliza was staying with the widow woman, her son, and the son died. And she appealed to the man of God, in 2 Kings 4 and 33. And Eliza prayed and laid upon the child, and life returned back to him. What's dead in your life that needs to be restored? What, what's not going in your life that you need God to give you wisdom, to guide you with, to help you go through? We all know about Job. Lost everything he's had. His possession, his family, his health. But God restored him. Not only did he restore him, he gave him double for his trouble. God is our restorer today. He's the restorer of our wealth and prosperity. Wealth, when we, sometimes when we think of wealth, we, we, we tend, our mind tendencies go to finances. But what about our health? What about our mindset? What about our mental stability? What about things that are going on with our children? What about these things that we need God to work on, for, show us how to work on to get them restored in our life? We want God to do everything, but we don't want to do nothing. But I'm here today to tell you that he is a restorer. But we have to understand what the restoring is all about. Joel 2 and 21 says, Fear not, O land, be glad. Rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Joel 2 25 says it's like this, And I will store unto you the years that the locust had eaten up, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I set among you. What is it that the enemy has devoured? What it is that the enemy has destroyed? What habit is that we have even destroyed through our disobedience that you're praying and asking God to restore? Is it our health? Are you going through a type of sickness? What is it that you need God to restore in your life? He's the restorer of our soul, our mind, our will, and emotions. Psalms 23 and 3 says it like this. He restored my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Jeremiah 30 and 17 for our health. He says, For I will restore health unto you, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, says the Lord. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is thine, who, man, who no man seeketh after. Sometimes it's our physical health. Sometimes it's our mental health. But he can restore it. He can restore. He can restore your freedom. Isaiah 58 and 6 says it like this. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, that ye break every yoke? What's got you yoked down? What's got you in bondage? What have you permitted the enemy to put you in bondage with because you disobeyed what God was telling you to do? And John 8 and 36 says it like this. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Free of a right spirit. David says like this. Purge me with his set, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. A right, renew a right spirit in me. God changed my mindset. Because you can't put new wine in an old wine skin. Many times God is trying to bless us with things and restore things and because we have the old mindset of how things used to be. It's just like they're saying now. Well, I want things to go like they used to be. There's no more of the used to be. The used to be has gotten us where we are right now. Because we have disobeyed God. And we have not kept the commandments that he told us that we needed to do. We have not followed the instructions. The church is so divided today. We're divided in our walk. We're divided in our talk. We don't have to wait for the world to talk about us. Because it's right there among us. Because we can't get along as one. We're so divided. We're so jealous of each other's gift. We're envious of each other's gift. We can't stand to see the other prosper. We can't stand to see the other one get ahead. But the thing of it, and the truth of the matter is, is that if you follow those same instructions that God has given us in the Word, you can also get ahead as well. But we don't want to follow the instructions because it's too big. Okay, God, give me what I want, but let me do what I want to do. We're like the Isaac brothers. It's my thing, and I do what I want to do. And the thing about it is, is that the word tells us to obey the laws of the land. Can I help you out? If you're not going to obey the laws of the land, how are you going to obey God? Well, I'm going to do what God... No. Because if you're not obeying the laws of the land, which he has instructed us to do, how are you going to obey his word? Just like in the garden, where falsehood had influence, restoration is required. The joy of the, for the joy of the Lord is our salvation. Psalms 51 and 12 through 13 says it like this. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy right spirit. Then will I teach transgressions thy way, and the sinner shall be converted to thee. You know, we're so busy running around wanting God to do something for us, and it is so many people out here hurting it is so many people out here that don't know Christ. We have all this modern technology and all these things in place, but yet we still got so many people that are lost because the church is too busy fighting among themselves. And the Lord has said, enough is enough. When the Lord had me studying, he said, I wanted you, he said, go back and look at Jeremiah 30 from Sunday. He said, I want to show you something. And in the process of studying, he says, Jeremiah went through three phases. He said there was the warning. Then there was the battle, the, the going without, the doing without, the struggles that they had. 
Where are we now? And the Lord said that this epidemic is not over. It's going to come in three phases. We just hit phase one. Phase two is fastly approaching us. But my question is, will you be prepared? Because everybody's saying, well, I'm uh, out in the hurry and saying, well, I'm social distancing. Yeah, you may be social distancing, but it don't mean you won't get the virus. That's just a precaution that they set up. But are you hearing from the instructions from God? Have you consulted God before you left out of your house that day to get the instructions for that day or even where to go or what to say and what to do? Have you consulted the Father? Have you even spent time with the Father? God is returning. The influence of the falsehood has was gone. Now families are having no choice but to spend time in the house together. It's sad when God has to permit something to happen to make us to get spend time with our children. And when some of our children are begging for us to spend time with. Many of you complain about what the teacher was doing. Now you got them at home with you. So where's the problem really at? His plans for marriage. He wants them to return to the original plan that he had planned for marriage between a male and a female. For parenting. That, that children are to obey your parents. But the parents are not to provoke their children to wrath, to anger. He gave us guidelines. Why do you think he gave us the guidelines? I, I think many people think that the Bible, they said the Bible is the most read book there is, but it's the least book to be followed. We'll do everything that Dr. Seuss and Dr. Sparks say do, but both of them had to come back and apologize because they said some things and messed up some families' lives. But it's too late now. So we think. But God is restored for salvation. We don't call, we don't say repent in the church anymore. We don't talk about repentance in the church no more. We don't talk about holiness in the church no more. We don't talk about heaven or hell in the church no more. There's only heaven or hell. But God is trying to put you in a place of restoration to restore you, to get you to a place, a right relationship with him where you can walk with him and be with him eternally. But you got to be like the word says, you got to deny yourself. And that's the biggest problem we find today, that people don't want to deny themselves. Well, they talked about me. Well, they lied on me. I just can't forget. But the thing of it is, is that if we don't get to a place, this next wave is going to take a whole lot more than what it's already taken. Because people don't want to line up and they don't want to obey. He wants the church to return back to unity. He wants the church to return back to one. Why is it the church is so busy hating on each other? We make fun of each other. We talk about each other. When we should be praying for each other and, and giving the word of God. And God is saying enough is enough. I want to restore. I love you, but I don't love the sin that you're in. Just like with Israel, just like in Jerusalem, just like with Judea, it cost all of them. And God had to come back and restore. Because he still loved them. 
and God still loves you. But when are you going to accept him into your life and let him be the author, the finisher of your life, the director, your healer, your deliverer? You know, we call on God. I find it strange. We call on God when we want something. We call on God when we need something. We call on God when we're in a crunch. But when everything is going our way, we don't praise Him. We don't worship Him. We don't come to service. We don't come to Bible study. And right now, we can't. Everything is on TV. But I, I, I find it. I'm, I'm finding the Lord showed me. He says, look at the views. He says, you're reaching more people on the views than you are with them in the sanctuary, in the sanctuaries. He says, so it's important that you make each moment count. It's important right now when we are talking with people, when we are walking with people, where, when people are in our presence, it's important that we make every moment count because God is counting down the time. No man knows the day of the hour. Only the Father knows. He said, I'm coming back like a thief in the night. He wants us to return back to worship. Many people don't want to worship. We can jump up and down, and we can run all through the church, and, but we don't want to worship God. Because worship means that I got to let go of my feelings. I got to let go of my pain. I got to let go of how I feel today and get out of myself, get out of control and allow God to be in control. We are so control mechanism that we can, we can't stand to get out of control to let something be out of control because we think we got to handle everything and then when we mess it up we need ask ask God to come fix it and when He doesn't come when we want Him to come then we get upset with God we get mad with God but when He tried to come He wanted to come in you wouldn't allow Him to come in. What situation is that you are not allowing God to come in? What situation is going on that you are not allowing God to be part of? That you need to step back and allow God to be the restorer. That allow him to give you the answer that you need for the situation and the time that you're in. Sometimes it's not up to us to say anything. Because we have to understand Sometimes he tells us to be quiet. It's not that we're cowering down and it's not that he says, but I need you to be quiet so I can do this. I need you to keep your mouth off this so I can say what needs to be said. But God wants to restore today. And he says that if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. And take up his cross daily and follow him. Who are you following today for the first day? Because guess what? When the pastor or the preacher or the apostle or the teacher or a uh, uh, woman or man or God don't do things the way we like or think, we're ready to go. But it's not about our feelings or what we think. Because the direction wasn't given to us. It was given to the head of the house. And God says we have to obey. God's people have often been challenged by one prophet after another to be faithful. Jeremiah challenged them. Ezekiel challenged them. Habakkuk challenged them. Nehemiah challenged them. One prophet after another has challenged God's people to line up and be faithful to God and turn back to God. He's called for repentance and restoration to God's fellowship once again. Which brings me back, which brings me to what I want to talk about today. If you have your word, Ezekiel 37, beginning at the first verse. And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out 
in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. And he led me among them, and behold, there were many on the surface of the valley. How many of us are looking around and we say so much death going on? I, I work at a facility where death has been all around me, but God still has kept me. And it was full of bones. And he led me among, around among them, and behold, there were so many on the surface and of the valley, and behold, they were all dry. Anybody in a dry situation right now? Anybody in a desperate situation right now? Anybody don't know which way to turn or how to turn or even what to say, what to do, how to act? And you can see no hope in place. But there is hope. But we're so caught up in the virus till we can't see God. And even in the midst of the virus, he's still blessed. Even in the midst of the virus, he's still healing. Even in the midst of the virus, he's still delivering. Even in the midst of the virus, he's opening up the prison doors of the virus. Even in the midst of the virus. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I also said, Lord, oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over the bones and say to them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Those bones were in a valley, in a plain, in a vast area. It was so wide. It was so many bones. Perhaps most likely they were bones of dead soldiers or people that have died in the area. But it was a valley of dry bones. There was no life among them. And he said to me, prophesy over these bones. What are you saying about your situation? Are you cursing the situation or are you blessing the situation with what you say? For the power of life and death is within the tongue. So what are you speaking over yourself? You are what you say. If you always going to be broken, you continue to prophesy that over yourself, guess what? You're going to always be broke. So what are you saying over yourself? What are you even saying over your children? What are you saying about when you go to work? What, what are you saying, mummering and, and complaining about? What kind of words are coming out of your mouth? Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Are you giving the Lord, the bone, your bones, your, your situation, the words? Are you speaking life? Because God's word said, I came that you might have life, but not only have life, have it abundantly. Ephesians said, 3 says it like this, he's a God that can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think or ask according to the power that worketh in us. So what are you speaking? What are you speaking into the atmosphere concerning your situation? Thus said the Lord God to the bomb, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sewers upon you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover your skin and breath in you. You shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. What did he say? So I prophesied as I was commanded. In other words, he did what the Lord told him to do. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And they became a rattling. And the bones came together. Bone to its, its bone. And I looked and behold, and there were sins on them. And the flesh came upon them. And the skin had covered them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, say, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on 
these slain that they may live. And I asked Lord, I said, okay, Lord, help me out just a little bit. I said, I know there's the north, south, east, and west. He said, yes. He said, but there's also prayer, praise, worship, and the word. He said, when you put that combination together, it will cause your situation to breathe life again. Because I'm going to praise him and I'm going to thank him for the situation being taken care of in advance. I'm going to give him the sacrifice of praise. I'm going to give him the advanced praise. And while I'm praising him, since I'm praising him, I'm going to worship him for a little while and I'm going to thank him for what he's done. And then he said I could remind him of the word. That I could say, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Anybody need a taste today just to see that the Lord is good? He said, oh, breathe and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into me. And they lived and stood on their feet, and an exceeding army. When you speak according to the word, when you give the enemy what the word of God is saying, not what my feeling is saying, not what I think, but what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And when you say what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, there is life, there is healing, there is deliverance, there is restoration. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are whole house of Israel. What are you saying about the United States? What are you saying about the government? What are you saying? Are you praying or are you mumbling and complaining? What kind of words are coming out of your mouth? Are there words to kill the situation? Or are there words to bring life into a dead situation? Which one are you doing? Behold, these bones are dried up. And our hope is lost. But our hope is not lost today. For our hope is in Jesus Christ. The author and the finisher of our faith. Our hope is in him. Our hope is in that we put everything that he has given to us pertaining to life. He said I can remind him of his word. See, sometimes we're going to have to get the attitude like Jesus. When Satan came to him in the wilderness, he was tired. He had been on fast. But even the Holy Spirit had led him into the wilderness. And here comes the tempter. Because you know, the tempter going to come. And he waits right good sometimes to he even let you to ran all out and you done exhausted your energy and you done cried all you can cry and it's not doing no good. You done made yourself sick. And so he, here he comes to step on you. But how about giving the enemy the word? Because every time Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness, he said, it is written. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So what are you speaking to your situation? That you have a covenant relationship with God? Or is it that you're not sure about your relationship with him? Even in that, he says, it, he can restore. 1 John 1 and 9 says it like this. If I confess my faults, he's faithful and just to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So if I go to God with a sincere heart and say, Lord, I messed up. Forgive me. But the thing is, I can't go with lip service. My walk has to line up with my talk. I can, can't say, Lord, forgive me, and tomorrow I go back out and I do the same thing over again. But the word 
prayer in 1 John and 1 man says he's faithful. He's a good father. He's our father. And he's faithful. And he's just. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter what I got him in. No matter how I messed it up. He can pick me up. He can turn me around. He can place my feet on solid ground. I'm talking about restoring. I thought at one time I, I, I wasn't going to go back to school. And some dreams I wanted, just like Joseph, I, I thought those dreams were gone. But he restored it. And he let me know one thing, that the dream was not dead. As long as I was alive, the dream was still very much alive. What kind of dream, what are you dreaming down inside of you that you thought it, it, it's gone, that God wants to resurrect, that he wants to give life to, that he wants to breathe on those dry bones? What have you just thrown to the side and said, it's just no use no more? He can't help me. Yes, he can because he loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son. That's a price to pay, y'all. So why are we so ungrateful? I don't know about you, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful to a great God that I can speak to my situation. I'm coming to this evening and the wind was blowing so hard that I thought my car was actually going to blow off the road. And I said, okay, wind, you're going to have to be still. And if I tell you the wind got calm, I'm not telling you what somebody told me. I'm telling you what I know. Because I know who resides on the inside of me. Because he restored those things that the kinker worm and the locust have, have involved. He said, I'll even visit the iniquity to the third and fourth generation. He wants to clean up some things. So whatever in that generational bloodline won't go down that bloodline again. Because he wants to restore some things. Some things that maybe grandma or grandpa gave up that... You have the inheritance right to. Maybe it wasn't grandma and grandma. Maybe it was someone further down. And now you're coming into the promises that they prayed for, that they couldn't see just then and there, but they still held on to the promise that God was going to be God and he still was going to do what he said he's going to do. I might not see it in my day and time, but someone in my, my bloodline will see it. Because they didn't only pray for themselves. They prayed for the bloodline. They prayed for others. Who are you praying for? Who are you praying for? Who are you praying for? I didn't realize last week when I was praying. I didn't realize in my apartment I was praying that loud. And when I walked to go outside to go to uh, come out the garage... Um, and um, just looking at the weather and my neighbor on the side and he says I heard you praying and he said I told my wife he says we're in the right place and she said because she praying for us too he said I want to be about a neighbor that's praying about the neighbor he said you don't even know us but you're praying for us sometimes you got to get out of yourself because he says what you make happen for one I will make happen for you if you get out of what's going on with you and it's not saying ignore what's going on with you but I guarantee you when you start giving the enemy the word of God when you start walking in the word of God when you start living the word of God when you start speaking the word of God when you start giving God some glory where the man or woman of God doesn't have to pump you up to get you to stand up and praise God to worship God 
When you start giving him the glory, when nobody ain't saying nothing, I got, I'm still going to give you the glory. I'm still going to give you the honor. I'm still going to give you the praise. Because he's worthy. Because he's a restorer. And he's a lifter of a hung down head. He's a lift. God wants to restore the church. He wants to put his word back in the people. His word. Not our word. But his word. Not our ideology. But God's word. God's word. Because he said, I sent my word, and it healed them, and it saved them from destruction. So it's in the word. So, so can these dry bones live? Yes, they can. They can live through the word of God. I can speak life, and I can speak it more abundantly. So tonight, make it a conscious decision that you're going to speak the word. That you're going to allow God to be your restorer. And that you're going to get out the way. And not try to make things happen. Because even though they want the restaurants to open, some of the restaurants are even finding workers. Hard to find workers to come back to the restaurants and work. Because they say that they're getting more unemployment than they are going to the restaurant and working. Because everybody's in a rush to get back to what we used to do. And what we used to do has gotten us where we are. And God is about to give us a, the church, the plan of restoration. And it's going to come through revival. That he's going to renew, revive, restore, and strengthen. Get ready for the revival. But there's some things that's got to come before the revival comes. But I encourage you men and women of God to stand firm in the word. And hold on to God's unchanging hand. And allow God to be God in every situation of your life. We thank you for joining us tonight. Don't forget about online giving at secondchanceworshipcenter.org. We thank you for being with us for this moment. Get in your word. Get in a place of worship. We thank you. And good night.